CBS News presents Look Up and Live. Today, Soviet Jews, a culture in peril. Here is CBS News correspondent Stuart Novins. This is a report on the Soviet Union's attitude toward its Jewish citizens, those they permit to leave and those for whom emigration is blocked. It is a report on what it's like to be a Soviet Jew. Jews have lived in what is now the Soviet Union for nearly 2,000 years. very rare film footage, which shows Jews of the Carpathian region a generation ago, is certainly not representative of the life of Jews in Russia now. But it serves to remind us of the long tradition that precedes the present-day anguish of Soviet Jews. It has never been easy for them. There are records of pogroms as early as the 12th century, when the old Orthodox Church urged the people to abolish the enemies of God. In the 17th century, one finds references to treaties between Russian and Polish kings, allowing merchants access to the prosperous new city trade centers. Common to those treaties were the fateful words, Kromia Zhedov, except for Jews. They were hounded from one province to another. Catherine I expelled them from her domain of Little Russia in 1727. Catherine II, the great, desiring to improve contacts with the West, actually invited foreigners to settle, but again, Kromia Zhedov. But a few years later, with the partition of the old Polish kingdom, large numbers of Jews, Polish Jews, suddenly found themselves subject to Russian law. The Ashkenazi, or European Russian Jewish community, as a persecuted minority forced to live in the pale, the proscribed territory, dates from that political turning point. Their numbers grew until, during the pogroms between 1880 and 1914, two million Jews left Russia swelling the ranks of what has become the American Jewish community and many South American communities as well. Today, there are still more than three million Jews in the USSR, more than in Israel. Perhaps a quarter million are the descendants of those Jews who wandered there 2,000 years ago to Georgia, Bukhara, and the Caucasus. Today, 95% of the Jews of the USSR live in cities, half of them in a dozen large cities. Moscow. Leningrad, Kiev, Odessa, Riga, Vilna, Kharkov, Chernovich, Kishinev, Blisi, Baku, Tashkent. Although only one and a half percent of the total population 
Jews constitute one of the larger recognized minority nationalities among the more than 100 national groups in the USSR, but they are dispersed. And unlike most other groups, they have no relationship to a piece of land of their own. The region set aside for them in 1928, with its capital of Birabijan, is 4,000 air miles from Moscow. It was from the beginning a politically inspired experiment, and although some pioneering Jews gave their lives to it, it was twice strangled in political purges and is today a Jewish region in name only. The sign at the railway station is Yiddish, and a tiny party-like newspaper is published in Yiddish. Otherwise, it is no different from the rest of the Soviet Union. No Jewish schools, no Jewish theater, no Jewish life. When Ari Eliyav, who was first secretary to the Israeli embassy in Moscow, visited Bira Bijan, he offered the town library, which is named for Sholem Aleichem, the Yiddish writer, three books, Sholem Aleichem, The Diary of Anne Frank, and The Dead Sea Scrolls. The librarian paled and said quickly, our readers wouldn't be interested, no thank you. An old man standing nearby, writes Eliav, directed a penetrating glance at me from sad eyes and heaved a deep sigh. And this is the essence of the Jewish tragedy in the Soviet Union today. Unlike the other national groups, they are deprived of nearly all means of perpetuating their culture. Even tiny minorities like the Tajiks, Kyrgyz, and Turkmens have schools where their own languages are used in instruction. The Jews have none. Russian Muslims and Russian Methodists have frequent official contacts with their co-religionists abroad. The Jews have none. Yiddish theater, once one of the true glories of Russian arts, has been stifled in the Soviet Union. Yiddish literature, which produced men of international reputation, is choked off. The government-controlled presses simply don't print the books. The list of grievances is long. It even includes the difficulty in getting Passover matzah in most Jewish communities. Men in 1963 were arrested, lost their jobs, were taunted as foreign agents because they accepted matzah sent them from abroad. Yet the destruction of the framework of Jewish cultural life in the Soviet Union has not meant the assimilation of the Soviet Jews. Although in the half century since the Bolshevik Revolution, many Jews have disappeared into mixed marriages. The Jew in Russia today lives and works side by side with his neighbors. And yet, like all Soviet citizens, he has an identity card which lists his nationality. If it says Yevrei, Jew, he will probably seldom advance to the highest rank in his field of employment. He will come under the quota system still in force in institutions of higher learning. And he will be a very special kind of defendant if he ever runs afoul of Soviet law. Despite the fact that the path of least resistance is to surrender their Jewishness, Soviet Jews have tried to retain an inner identity. There's a hunger for things Jewish. Members of the Moscow synagogue often plead with foreign visitors for their prayer shawls. They're not available in the Soviet Union. The huge Leningrad synagogue is closed, except on the Sabbath and Jewish holidays, and on the Sabbath attendance is small because many people work a six-day week. Yet the seats for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Passover, are fully subscribed a year in advance. Small groups, mainly of young people, have secretly gathered to affirm their Jewishness by celebrating holidays illegally. This film shows a group in a forest near Moscow defiantly honoring Israel's Independence Day. Just the fact that Jews have risked their safety by filming scenes like this visit to an illegally reconstructed Jewish cemetery near Riga bears witness to their determination not to disappear as a culture. Ala Ruzanek is a young Soviet Jew who was recently permitted to emigrate to Israel. Her husband was kept in the Soviet Union. The couple decided she would go, and she left. We asked her, at what time in the life of a young Soviet Jew does he realize that he's being deprived of his Jewish heritage? Friends and family, we have our Jewish problems when we're children, when we're seven years old, when we go to school. What kind of problems? The problem of anti-Semitism, this is the beginning, because we know that we're Jews, it is written in our papers, and when we go to school, the first question we must answer, our name and nationality. And children know that they are Jews, but they don't understand the meaning of this word. 
they only understand one thing, they must be ashamed of it, and they are afraid to say it in the presence of the whole class. Because for Russian children, it is like an insult, they use it as an insult, the word Jew. And some of the Jewish children have to answer this question aloud, and they are afraid, and they answer this question in a whisper. But you know, when we are children, we don't really think about these problems, we just feel. We're afraid, we're ashamed. We know that we're Jews, but we don't think about the meaning of this. But when we finish our school, we're already 17 or 18, and we have to think about the meaning of this word. What does it mean to be Jewish? Does it mean to be always ashamed of it or afraid of it? The meaning in life of this word is the practical meaning that we go to find a job or to enter the university and we must show our identity card the first page of it where it is written Jew and whenever or wherever we show it we know the attitude to us would be different sometimes we can't find the, the job the good job and sometimes we are not admitted to the university this is the practical meaning of this word. Let me ask you in your own experience, what was the first time that you suddenly realized that you were separate from the others because they wanted you to be separate? I always felt it because uh, I, like other Jewish children, had to say, to answer this question about my nationality in the presence of the whole class. It was a terrible experience. I was always afraid, and I was one of these children who answered this question in whisper. And I was always isolated from my Russian classmates. And then I wanted to enter the special high school uh, to study English, and I was not admitted. And nobody explained me the reason. When they deprive us of something because of anti-Semitism, they don't say it because we are Jewish. They say some other reasons. And so I didn't understand. But my mother was talking to some of her friends and using some very strange word for me. The first foreign word I heard in my family it was anti-Semitism. I, I asked her what was the meaning of this word. She didn't answer them. This was my first experience. Anti-Semitism was officially condemned and it became a crime under the revolutionary Bolshevik regime. Lenin, Trotsky, himself a Jew, even Stalin, all spoke out publicly against it. In his purported memoir, Khrushchev calls anti-Semitism a shameful thing and he laments that it was very much with us in the old days and is hard to get rid of. Yet the Soviet Union has always been willing to sanction or promote anti-Jewish sentiments to serve specific ends. Stalin's open murder of Jewish intellectuals and the destruction of Jewish religious and cultural institutions in the 1940s are the most blatant and inhuman example of this policy. Time magazine quotes a Dr. Arya Levran, who left Russia a few years ago, as saying, in buses and trains and in queues outside stores, you hear the words, Jid. Yid, and Abrashka, Abi, and how the crafty Jews grab up everything and cause the shortages. There is probably not a single Jew in the Soviet Union, said Dr. Levran, who has not heard a drunkard voice his regret that Hitler did not finish off all the Jews. Despite official pronouncement, anti-Semitism is kept alive in the Soviet Union in many ways. These anti-Israeli political cartoons from Soviet newspapers set the tone. To the mass audience, the implication is clear. Jews are part of Judaism, a hostile ideology linked with Zionism, which is an imperialist puppet. Pravda, February 4, 1970. Nazi and GI advisors direct Israeli demolition of Arab village. Red Star, published by the Defense Ministry. The caption reads, Tel Aviv Express Zionism. Pravda's warning is not misunderstood by Russia's Jews. Protest makes one automatically an agent of international Zionism and hence an enemy of the Soviet people. Yet protest continues, especially among the young. 
even the most daring form of protest, the demand to be allowed to emigrate. Boris Smolar, whose half-century of experience as a correspondent and editor for the New York-based Jewish Telegraphic Agency has taken him often throughout the Soviet Union, he says in his new book, Soviet Jewry Today and Tomorrow, that in Russia today, among the young people who risk seeking emigration to Israel, the feeling prevails that for them, the time for fear has passed, as long as they can refer to the Soviet Constitution. They assert that under the Constitution, they have a right to emigrate. Again, Ala Ruznik. The Constitution of the Soviet Union says a lot of things. The freedom of demonstration, of speech, of religion, freedom everywhere. But um, our life there teaches us not to believe the words. And uh, we don't have the freedom of demonstration, of speech, of religion. We are taught only hatred to religion, but we don't understand what does it mean, religion. And the freedom of leaving the country. Of course, nobody is allowed to leave the country if he wants to do it. Now, the Soviet Constitution flatly says that anybody who wants to immigrate may do so. He may just leave the country. How does this work? Do any of the young Soviet Jews try to use legal procedures invoking the Constitution to get All out? All these people who are trying to leave the country use only legal procedure, and they are not allowed to leave. We apply to the Ministry of Interior Affairs for exit visas, and we were not allowed to leave for many years. Many families applied since the 50s, for 20 years, for 15, 10 years, just using only legal procedure. Nobody is trying to cross the border, no. We use only this. And while applying, we see that we are applying according to the Constitution of the Soviet Union and Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations. So we use it, but... Um, doesn't help us. They don't allow us to leave. We have to hand in lots of documents, character reference from our place of work, reference from our place of living, permissions from all our direct relatives. Are you able to get those? Sometimes no. Sometimes our employers don't give us character reference. So that even though you tried to work through the legal procedure, they use Sometimes the legal procedure to prevent it. That's why we say that half a million would leave, because uh, 40,000 families manage to get all, all these documents, and some families can't do it. And uh, the students who study at the universities have to take this character reference from the university, but the university doesn't give this character reference. Mr. Smolar also contrasts the purpose of Soviet propaganda with its unintended effect. Many young Jews in the USSR, he points out, are outwardly assimilated. No Jewish traditions, no knowledge of Jewish history or of Hebrew, hardly anything but Jew written in their identity papers. Were you limited in how you could learn about Judaism? It was impossible when I wanted to do it after finishing high school. But after the Six-Day War, when I heard about Israel, I began to learn about Jewish culture and history from the point of view of Israel. I learned about the state where Jews live. This is um, their state. They're equal there. They have Jewish culture, religion. And for me to learn that there is Jewish nation in a state. It was a revolution inside me. And I understood that the Jewish nation is something like every nation, Russian nation, English, French, just we are like all other people. And um, it was great to learn the first facts about Jewish history. It is dangerous because um, they watch and follow all these people who are interested in Judaism and Jewish history. They understand it has something to do with Zionism. So they watch us, they follow us, so it is dangerous. And sometimes it is very difficult. They don't publish books about Jewish history. And we have to, f to look for some old publications, old I mean 
published before the Great October Revolution. And we find them and we help each other to learn the history and to study Hebrew, of course. What is the situation today? Persecution may drive people before it in fear, but it also compacts them and hardens the inner core of resistance. And this is not what the present Soviet government wants. People are not being massacred as under the Nazis, but their spiritual world and their ability to transmit it to their children are being killed. One of the tools of this new persecution is to make the Jew invisible. The Jews are not a nation, says the great Soviet encyclopedia. They have no common language, no territory, no common culture. And it concludes, there is no Jewish problem in the USSR. Karl Marx's Jewish origins are seldom mentioned in Russian education. Indeed, Jews hardly exist at all in Russian school books. The widely used high school text, Novishaya Historia, for example, covers World War II and its aftermath without any mention of the slaughter of Jews by Germans and without any observation of the establishment of the State of Israel. For home consumption, the government tries to ignore Jewishness whenever it makes a positive impression. The death of the writer, Kazakiewicz, brought forth flattering obituaries but no mention of his career as a Yiddish author. When Khrushchev told a foreigner that Jews in Russia had been in the vanguard of space research, that reference was omitted from the text as published in Soviet papers. In a defensive pamphlet published by the government's Novosti Press Agency entitled Soviet Jews as They Are, which is for foreign consumption, it is pointed out that of 844 winners of the Lenin Prize, 96 have been Jews. But this information would be hard to come by in the Soviet Union itself. Now what is the ultimate goal of Soviet anti-Semitism? It's easy enough to appreciate the government's keen embarrassment at the swift defeat of its Arab clients in the Six-Day War. And many anti-Jewish slurs flowed immediately from that event. And it's easy to see how convenient it is to perpetuate the age-old role of the Jew as scapegoat, responsible for shortages and other social ills. He takes the blame off the system itself. But there is also a long-range goal, which some Soviet experts say will eventually hit all the national minorities. Any sense of separateness, runs this argument, endangers the solidarity of the working masses and the establishment of a classless society. The Jew has regularly been condemned as cosmopolitan, a man not bound loyally to this here and now and this land. In an unguarded moment, Khrushchev once told a foreign reporter peevishly that the Jews burrow into everything and question everything. Now, if there is a historical Jewish trait the searching Jewish mind, the Soviet government fears it. And the traditional Jewish love for higher education and for success in the most difficult intellectual pursuits tend to bring Jews toward the top of the social scale, which just intensifies the fear. The Soviet government has never been able to accept the Jews as us. It views the Jews as them. Now, working backward from that fear to anti-Jewishness in daily life is simple. An old Bolshevik confided to the late American Zionist leader, Joseph Schechtman, Judaism is dangerous. Religion helps maintain cohesion, and it nurtures the feeling of belonging to a distinctive Jewish entity. And that, he said, is what we're trying to prevent. This animosity toward distinctive entities would eventually force the assimilation of all separate cultures in the USSR. The aim of socialism, said Lenin, is not only to abolish the present division of mankind into small states, not only to bring the nations closer to each other, but also to merge them. The current period is being used to encourage cultural bonds within national groups. Zromia Zhidov, except the Jew. A recent petition of 77 Jews to the United Nations pleaded, we are the only people here who are ordered openly to assimilate, dissolve, disappear. World opinion has reacted with unexpected sharpness to the more overt Soviet examples of harsh treatment of Jews. Not all Jewish leaders are of the same mind about the effectiveness of such protest. Some would prefer to work behind the scenes. They fear that if the Soviet government is embarrassed, it will take out its anger on the Soviet Jews. Others say that nothing else has worked in the past and that mustering world opinion is the only reliable form of pressure. 
The recent Brussels meeting of 700 Jews from 30 countries established for the first time a worldwide forum on the question of Soviet Jewry. It proposed an international commission of inquiry to convene whenever necessary to keep the question alive. Only time will tell if it's going to be effective. The great Russian writer Maxim Gorky said, I am astonished by the spiritual strength of the Jewish people, by their courageous idealism, their unshakable belief in the triumph of good over evil and the possibility of happiness on earth. It's so difficult to be optimistic in Russia, even now when many families are allowed to live. I can't really speak about optimism. This is despair, and this is great courage because of despair. You heard about this demonstration of 24 Jews in the building of, of the Supreme Soviet. This is not optimism. This is despair. They risked their lives when they went to the Supreme Soviet and sat there for nine hours. This is not optimism. They decided whether Israel or prison. Are there any who are changing themselves now to openly avow their Jewishness? First of all, in the Soviet Union, we can't choose our nationality. And in order to be, for a Jew to be registered as Russian or Ukrainian, well, he must bribe somebody. Or just I'm talking uh, now about somebody who's registered as a Ukrainian who wants to register as a Jew. These are people who were born to mixed marriages, and some of their parents were non-Jewish. Then they could choose non-Jewish nationality. And there are many young people now who are registered as Ukrainians or Russians, but they identify themselves with Judaism and Israel, and they want to be Jews. But in order to be Jew in the Soviet Union, you must suffer as a Jew. And that's why they want to change their nationality in their identity card. It is also not possible because they go to the police station and they ask to change this nationality and they are not allowed to do it because in the Soviet Union, the main thing is identity card, but not a man. And uh, they are struggling for it. And some of them managed to do it. And some of them even became practicing Jews now. They want to be Jews. They want to be proud Jews. And uh, there is a good example of uh, one of the people who was sentenced to death in Leningrad trial. And then his uh, death sentence was commuted. Um, and uh, he was sentenced to 15 years of hard labor in prison, Eduard Kuznetsov. He was registered as Russian, and he changed his nationality and his identity card to a Jew. And he was on trial as a Jew. How would your children grow up differently than you grew up, your children growing up in Israel? I can't imagine it. Of course, I'll tell them a lot about my life and my experience. But they will be born in Israel. I'm sure they would be quite different. What would you tell them, do you think, about living in a free society like Israel's? I would teach them to appreciate it and to be able to compare it with what people have. I'm sure when my children will be grown-ups, they would be the same in other countries like the Soviet Union. And I would teach them to appreciate everything they have in Israel and to be proud Jews. I couldn't be a proud Jew in the Soviet Union. I want them to be proud Jews and to be Israelis. Ala Ruzanek's husband, after years of painful effort, has now been permitted to leave the Soviet Union. They are together now, in Israel, free to live their own lives. For them, a happy ending, perhaps, or more accurately, a happy beginning. 
This cannot be said of those Jews whom the Soviet Union will not permit to leave. For them, no happy ending, no beginning. Stuart Novins, CBS News. CBS News has presented Look Up and Live. Today, Soviet Jews, a culture in peril.